Can you give baby a kiss? Mm -hmm. <laughs> The level of fear that you feel, the level of um, anxiety that you feel, and I was just like, I could, I could be done. I could just be done and run away. After I took a breath and thought it through, I was just like, no. Allison Blasfield and her husband Eric went through an experience that no parent should have to go through. It started early in her pregnancy. They told me it was a boy. Then they said. And we wanted to tell you that there's a 77% positive test result for Down syndrome. You know, it was just kind of this instant like sinking feeling. My husband's reaction when I told him that our baby was gonna have Down syndrome. It was very calm and it was just, you know, whatever happens, babe, like we'll roll with it. It's, you know, it's cool, don't worry about it. Um, while I'm sitting there like sobbing, like freaking out. She shared the diagnosis on social media. People from the Down syndrome community just welcoming us, um, showing love, and just giving us a big hug through the internet, just telling us like, you guys don't even know, you're so, like, you're gonna love this, like, don't be scared. You have no idea how much like good things are in store for you with this. Allison and Eric got more difficult news at a checkup. What they're doing is they're testing the amount of fluid that is sitting behind baby's neck. It's called a nuchal translucency test. Then the doctor came in to tell us that the test results weren't good and that they believed he was developing a condition called high drops, which is when excess fluid builds up underneath the baby's skin and it goes throughout their body. And they told us that eventually it would reach his heart and his lungs, and then um, his heart would stop beating. High drops could happen to any child. It's not specific to Down syndrome. It's very rare um, that the baby will survive to birth. It's very, 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 very rare. They waited for answers. It was, it was hell. Um, it was horrible. And um, that was it was in those two weeks that we decided what his name was going to be. I did not want to go back to that next appointment without naming him. So Eric and I decided that his name was Ethan, which means strong and enduring, which is just so fitting, so fitting for him. We were just like shaking, like so nervous because we didn't know if he was going to be alive. Like when they went to go scan my tummy and they said it's going to go to his right lung and it's going to go to his heart um, and then his heart's going to stop. At that point, they offered us a termination. Um, and it, you know, I remember sitting there when the doctor said, you know, like, here's your options, um, we can terminate. And I was just like, I could, I could be done. I could just be done and run away. Um, and after I took a breath and thought it through, I was just like, no. They decided not to terminate the pregnancy. And Eric and I told them, we're like, we're gonna, we're gonna take our son home, you know? <laughs> um, and we're just, we're gonna spend time, you know, as a family. And it, it kind of sounds funny because he's not like, you know, he was just 14 weeks you know, in my belly and stuff. But, you know, it was like, we're just, we're gonna let him go when he goes. I mean, I started researching like what a baby looks like, you know, at 15 weeks or at 16 weeks so that I didn't wanna be afraid of what my baby looks like because I knew that he wasn't gonna look like a, you know, a fully incubated baby. Um, so I, you know, I was trying to like prepare myself for that. They continued to prepare for Ethan's passing. We were so exhausted and so tired trying to get my daughter to go back to bed. And all of a sudden I felt Ethan kick. And it was just like, I was like, babe, Oh my gosh and i told him i was like he kicked i was like he's alive you know it was such a you know just a big breath of air after that like five day spurt i didn't i never went more than a day without feeling him move inside me so it just was like this constant like he's okay he's okay at 18 weeks there was another checkup you know we asked her we go you know, is there more fluid? Is there less fluid? Did it reach his heart yet? Did it reach his other lung? And she just sits there and goes, I don't see any fluid. And it was so casual. The doctor comes in and he just goes, 
Well, um, this never happens. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. And we're just like, he's like, the, the high drops is gone, you guys. Um, and we just, yeah, we just sat there. We're like, oh my gosh, like, is, is this what it feels like to witness a miracle? But more bad news followed. The doctor told us that they could see that Ethan had a heart defect. And they told us that his heart defect was so severe, they expected that he would um, be a fetal demise case so that he would, his body would give out um, in the womb and he wouldn't make it to birth. They told us that if he did make it to birth, survived birth, that um, it was likely he wouldn't live more than 24 hours. And again, at 24 weeks, they offered us another termination. At that point, I was annoyed. <laughs> I was like, no, we're good. Like we're, I'm, I'm scared right now, but we're keeping our baby. Doctors devised a plan. If Ethan could make it to 36 weeks, he could possibly have heart surgery. You know, every week that we went into that appointment, we would get ourselves to a place of like, okay, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And then we would leave the doctor's office, like just broken. So you, we had to hear that, that our child wasn't going to make it so many times throughout the pregnancy and just continuing to like <clears throat> push on and go forward. Allison, Eric, and Ethan continued to fight through the rest of the pregnancy. Allison went into labor sooner than they wanted. We are making it to 36 weeks. Like, this is 35 weeks. We have at least one more week to go. I am not in labor. So Eric and I both were just like, we're going for it. In December of 2022, Ethan was born seven and a half pounds at 35 weeks gestation. I knew I wasn't, he wasn't gonna be laid on my chest. We weren't gonna get to do skin to skin or anything like that. Um, so they had said that Eric can hold up his phone and FaceTime. So they held Ethan up to the screen and he's sitting there crying. And I was able just to like touch him through the screen. We're all just, it, you know, we all breathed when we heard him cry. And I actually heard, I will never forget this. I heard my husband just make like this sound of just relief, like leaving his body when, when we heard Ethan cry. Ethan's life in a hospital began. So he was in the NICU for about a month before he was transferred to Children's Hospital to the cardiac ICU. And Eric and I lived there with him. It was still a severe defect, but he it was not as severe as they had originally thought. He would receive a open heart surgery. Every few days we'd wean down his oxygen support and we would watch to see how well he handled it. And then one day he, they did a oxygen wean and he ended up kind of just falling off a cliff at that point. And his, um, all of his numbers started to get really bad. After months in the hospital an 11 hour open heart surgery and various other procedures, Ethan's health began to decline. We, we had been told many times that he was getting worse and that he likely wasn't going to make it. But in our mind, we had heard that so many times before and he had come so far and he had like, we had gotten so like days away from going home once. So in our minds, we were like, we're gonna get back there. We are absolutely going to get back there. We had gotten ourselves in just such a mode of just fight, 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 fight. Every day there was a new fire. Every day there was a new battle to go through. The couple realized fighting wasn't enough. At one point, um, the nurse practitioner said to us during rounds, she was like, if it gets to be time where you'd like to let him go, um, we can clear the roof for you guys and we can take all of his equipment up to the roof and you guys can sit and hold him again and we can make it a very peaceful um, experience for you guys. And, you know, Eric and I were like, okay, okay. Um, and then almost, almost simultaneously later that day, we both were like, we have to stop fighting. We need to let him go. The more we sat and thought about it, the more it was just, blaring in our face like 
it's time. It's time today. You know, it became time to take Ethan up to the roof. He had never been outside. So this was his very first time like being outside Mount Rainier, which is, um, it's a very special mountain to me. Climbing Mount Rainier was a way that I dealt with my sister's passing. So we got out to the roof and only some days in Seattle can you see Mount Rainier. And we got out to the roof and right as we walked out there, it was just Mount Rainier was just there. And it was just huge and big in the sky. They moved a park bench so that it faced Mount Rainier and they wheeled all of Ethan's hospital equipment over to the park bench. It was the first time that Ethan had been held in over a month because he had been so delicate up until that point. And so Eric sat and held him for um, a while and then they transferred Ethan to my arms. And it was in my arms um, that they took him off of um, his life support. That's okay. <laughs> um, you know, we got to have, um, music playing. We got to, um, sit and hold him and tell him like how thankful we were for him. And just thank him for being our son, for, um, for fighting as hard as he did, um, to stay with us and, we told him that, you know, it was okay to go and it was okay to, um, to not fight anymore. I think it took about 10 minutes. Um, uh, Ethan passed away. You know, it was a very, very peaceful, calm, um, experience. The, um, the night Ethan died and the experience that we got was so special and so, um, beautiful and it's such a wonderful memory that we get to hold on to forever. After Ethan passed away, I turned around actually and there was this big pink and blue cotton candy sky, which was very symbolic to me because after my sister passed away, um, I really like there was just something about pink and blue cotton candy skies that just stuck out to me as being like a little hug from heaven, like just my sister saying hi. So it just, I cannot tell you how much peace we felt about the decision that we made um, with Mount Rainier being just shining bright with this big cotton candy sky that appeared right after Ethan died. Ethan's safe and he's okay and he's better and um, he's well and he's happy. And it just, you know, it was very peaceful and very beautiful. Ethan died on June 30th, 2023. His journey lasted for 199 days. They honored him with a celebration of life. It was literally everything that I could have ever wanted. I did not want to go to a sad, everyone was wearing black um, funeral and sit and sob. I, I already was sad. Like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't want to be more sad. Um, my son lived for 199 days, and we wanted to celebrate that. He pushed past. Um, more stuff than doctors ever thought that he would. And he broke barriers and proved that miracles happen. And I wanted to celebrate that. And so did everybody else. If I could have changed his heart defect diagnosis, I absolutely would, but never would I change the fact that he had Down syndrome because seriously, there was a light inside of that boy and he touched so many people's lives in his six and a half months here on this earth. Their family is now adjusting to their new normal. Goodness. Adjusting to um, going through grief with your partner is hard um, because grief is gonna come up in um, 
ugly ways. It's going to come up in beautiful ways. Um, it's not, grief is not just sitting on the couch crying, you know, holding your son's stuffed animal. It's, it comes out in anger. It comes out in frustration. It comes out in, you know, denial in so many different ways. Eric and I have developed the habit and gotten really good at seeking each other out when we're grieving. Um, and our daughter, she keeps us smiling. We'll be in the middle of just, you know, feeling such a loss, um, thinking about Ethan. And she just pops up and does something and just gets us laughing. And it's so amazing to have another child at home that helps pull you through your grief because she does. And she's such a light in our home. Ethan's story is a tough one to share, but Allison knows it helps her and helps others. I actually still feel a good amount of healing and peace talking about it and sharing Ethan's story. I had so many people reach out to me um, who, you know, said that they got a similar diagnosis alongside me and they just silently followed, you know, our story and they felt not so alone. Like I had this huge community cheering me on and um, praying for me and, you know, social media might have some really big downsides, but like it brings people together in such amazing ways. Being able to acknowledge like that, that situation that we were in, it's temporary. Your situation is temporary. It's not gonna last forever. Focusing on that and focusing on moving forward. Um, I don't think people move on from losing a child, but I think that you can move forward and we're moving forward. For Inside Edition Digital, I'm Andrea Swindle.